accendo soltanto il pistolino. Appena la regia ci dà il via. <ride> ok, ci siamo. Ci siamo. Allora, buongiorno a tutti, grazie di essere venuti eh, a questo incontro eh, con il nostro ospite, il professor Uskas del Berkman Center for Internet Society. Eh, io sono Juan Carlos De Martin eh, del centro Nexa su Internet e Società del Dipartimento di Automatica e Informatica qui al Politecnico e eh, sono molto lieto eh, di introdurre questa presentazione del professor Gasser, ma prima di dare la parola al nostro ospite sono molto lieto di avere qui con noi il nostro prolettore, la professoressa Laura Montanaro, che ringrazio di essere venuta a conoscere la parola. Grazie. Cari colleghi studenti, dear colleagues and students, just a few words uh, in English, since I'm uh, really delighted and proud to welcome Professor Castle to Politecnico, also on behalf of our uh, rector and all the academic staff, and I would also thank uh, you all uh, for sharing today uh, this uh, special event with us. Uh, let me say that uh, I am uh, really, really proud to have the opportunity today uh, to stay with you and uh, to introduce this uh, lecture on uh, very relevant topics for uh, our academic uh, medium. And uh, let me say that I am also proud since uh, this is uh, one of the steps of an important cooperation linking the Harvard University and our, uh, our Polytechnic. So since I'm not expert at all in the field of Internet Science, I beg your pardon, Professor Gasser, and I continue in Italian, uh, since I, I risk to make uh, big mistakes. <laughs> and I thank also uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor De Martin, to have given me some ideas for this introduction. Eh, la, la conferenza che citerà oggi il professor Gasser che è direttore del Beckman Center for Internet and Science della Harvard University è una conferenza che riguarda appunto internet internet nasce circa una quarantina di anni fa e si eh, connota in modo chiaramente eh, originale rispetto ai comuni metodi di comunicazione eh, sino ad allora noti, eh, pensiamo al telegrafo, al telefono, alla radio, alla televisione, mm, soprattutto per due aspetti, perché è un sistema di comunicazione decentrato in cui eh, ogni nodo della rete è in grado di collegarsi direttamente con altri nodi senza bisogno di eh, richiedere dei consensi o passare attraverso degli specifici filtri e il secondo eh, aspetto che lo connota in modo del tutto innovativo è il fatto che il nostro eh, il sistema internet è un sistema che permette una eh, multimodalità di, eh, di connessioni. La connessione 1 a 1 che è tipica ad esempio della comunicazione telefonica, la com connessione da uno verso molti che invece eh, lo accomuna per esempio ai sistemi quali la radio e la televisione ma anche eh, la connessione di molti con molti che ha portato alla, alla creazione poi dei cosiddetti social networks. Ehm, quando eh, verso la metà degli anni 90 sul, sulla base di internet è nata poi eh, la struttura web, ehm, alcuni eh, studiosi si sono resi conto della grande importanza e delle enormi potenzialità di, questa, eh, di questo nuovo strumento di comunicazione e eh, soprattutto si sono resi conto della necessità di dover dedicare a, a internet eh, degli studi eh, dedicati, approfonditi e soprattutto basati su un approccio multidisciplinare. E a questo proposito eh, mi fa piacere ricordare, sul suggerimento del professor De Martin, i professori Charles Nesson della Harvard Law School che ha fondato insieme a Jonathan Zitwain il primo centro Internet e Società, Internet e Society, proprio il Beckman Center for Internet and Society del Harvard University, del quale il professor Gasser è ora direttore. 
A seguito dell'esperienza diciamo pionieristica di questi eh, due colleghi sono sorti alcuni altri eh, centri eh, tra i quali possiamo ricordare l'Oxford Internet Institute, eh, il Center for Internet and Society della Stanford University e più recentemente eh, centri analoghi sono sorti all'Università di Keio in Giappone eh, presso l'Università di Berlino e anche l'MIT si è associato con un suo eh, media lab. Alla nascita di questi centri è poi ovviamente seguita anche fortunatamente l'attenzione di oculati e eh, intelligenti, smart finanziatori e tra i quali possiamo annoverare sicuramente la comunità europea in quanto la comunità europea ha proprio lanciato un network of excellence che è dedicato all'internet science e eh, questo network of excellence vede anche il nostro Politecnico come partner, come membro, partecipante e possiamo dire che la comunità europea ha ehm, la, la possibilità e l'interesse di eh, finanziare eh, attraverso call anche nel, nelle prossime call eh, argomenti di ricerca che riguardino proprio il binomio internet e società. Come si colloca il Politecnico in questo panorama? Il Politecnico si colloca tra le prime università a livello eh, internazionale eh, in quanto eh, nel novembre del 2006 è stato eh, creato presso il nostro Dipartimento di Automatica e Informatica il centro Nexa su eh, Internet e Society. Questo centro sin dalla sua nascita ha proprio iniziato a collaborare con i più prestigiosi centri di Internet e Society mondiali, tra i quali proprio il centro che è diretto dal professor Gar Gasser alla Harvard University e eh, proprio recentemente questo, questa collaborazione è eh, diventata oggetto di un accordo di cooperazione, per cui siamo estremamente orgogliosi di questo e speriamo in un fruttuoso cammino futuro. But now it's time to listen to you and to your lecture. Thanks again. Thank you. Please. Thank you to the Professor Montanaro. And um, just a few words of introduction to not only the Executive Director of the Bergman Center, Professor Gasser, but also uh, a close friend. It's a pleasure to have you back in Turin. Professor Uskesser uh, is a um, professor that uh, started his academic career in Switzerland, in particular at the St. Gallen University, and um, uh, is a visiting professor at the K University in Japan, fellow at the Grutter Institute of Law and Behavioral Research in the US. Uh, we have the pleasure and the honor of having him as a trustee of the Nexus Center for Internet Society here at the Polytechnico. Um, Professor Gesser will talk today about uh, the topic of interoperability, which is the subject of his latest book, which, is, which came out just uh, very recently, just a few weeks ago in the US, um, but also very well known, including in Italy, for an Italian translation of the previous book that he uh, wrote with his co-author and colleague, John Palfrey, which is Born Digital. In 2008, it was uh, one of the very few and the very first, actually, books about the topic of digital natives. Uh, it was tr uh, translated in Italian as uh, Nati con la rete, and, um, which has been translated in 10 languages, including Chinese. Uh, his uh, research activities and teaching activities uh, are um, uh, mostly focused on information law, and um, he's involved in several projects uh, in uh, actually several continents, in the United States, in Europe, and in Asia. And um, uh, just to mention a few, besides interoperability, besides, besides the interaction between youth and media, uh, also the, the topic of uh, the quality of information, which I know is, is close to his interest right now, the impact of the law in, on innovation, and um, alternative systems of governance. Um, so, Professor Gesser, as you can see, even though is, uh, is still very young, at least by Italian standards, has already an impressive curriculum, an impressive amount of accomplishments. So it's with extreme pleasure that I welcome him back in Torino, and uh, with great pleasure I give him the, the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. 
And I would actually like to start by congratulating you, Professor Montanaro, and your colleagues um, and the leadership of the Polytechnico for being the intellectual and institutional home of the Nexus Center for Internet and Society. The Nexus Center, under the uh, visionary and very able leadership of Professor Marco Ricolfi and Juan Carlos de Martin, uh, has actually become one of the world's finest research centers to explore internet and society issues. And in my opinion, this is a, a very important, a very important area of research. Uh, of course, we all use digital technologies in our lives, our children mentioned it, are deeply immersed. Um, they cannot imagine a life without the internet. That being said, um, we're still, from the research side, still at the very beginning uh, to gain a deeper understanding of the impact of the internet on society at large. Uh, and it's very important uh, to have research centers such as the Nexus Center that actually brings together uh, the finest engineers, computer scientists, together with lawyers, economists, um, policy makers and so forth uh, to have a constructive dialogue not only about the impact of the internet on society but also about how do we want to work together um, to build the internet of the future. As we all know, uh, we can't take for granted uh, the internet as it is in its current form. Uh, it's changing quickly. And we want to be very thoughtful together um, when thinking about the future design of the network. And that's why we need so much centers like uh, the Nexus Center here at the Polytechnico. Now, Juan Carlos in particular has not only been a visionary when he co-founded the Nexus Center uh, several years ago, has built this wonderful institution with a fabulous team, of course. Um, he's also um, visionary and looking forward. So, you know, Carlos has been one of the key drivers behind an international network of centers that we are about to build and soon announce, where various research centers focusing on internet and society issues will team up around the world um, to address especially the global challenges uh, we see emerge uh, with this, of course, global infrastructure called the internet. And I'm very excited about that and uh, I hope to welcome many of you, all of you also uh, in the US at the Birkin Center at Harvard and hope to continue the collaboration that has been so productive. So congratulations and thanks to you and of course to Juan Carlos and, and this fantastic team. Thank you so much. Okay. So uh, I would love to spend the next maybe 20 minutes or so on this topic of interoperability which is very close to my heart. Interop is uh, the story of an increasingly interconnected uh, world digital society in which technological systems but also organizations, governments even, and people exchange a lot of information, constantly exchange information. Now our over the past, I would say, six, seven years, we have studied at the Birkin Center uh, such systems that exchange information uh, and particularly focusing on systems that heavily use and rely on information and communication technologies, of course, the internet in particular. So three things um, are kind of driving us uh, first, we try to understand what are the costs and benefits of high levels of interconnectivity. And we are all connected, email, exchanging, tweets and so forth. What are the costs and benefits of this high level of connectivity among people but also among te technical systems and organizations? Uh, second question, guiding question is how much interconnectivity do we want to have? Uh, and, and then third, how do we design systems as we move forward? Um, to reach optimum level of interconnectivity or interoperability. So these are kind of the three motivating questions. The systems we've studied, and I will uh, use a few illustrations in the course of this presentation, um, uh, cover a broad range of areas. We have started with transportation systems, so railway, 
is a fantastic story of interoperability. The railway gauges in, in Europe had different sizes at different times and to understand how did we agree on certain standards and how did we make railway uh, gauges interoperable and what were the effects of that, for instance, for trade uh, and communication, very significant. Uh, but we also looked into more modern questions such as air traffic systems, air traffic control, but of course also, uh, among other things, the use of electronic records in, in healthcare, something that is a, a big uh, debate in the US, those of you in Europe, can we you know, move towards electronic health records to make our healthcare system more efficient uh, and improve its quality. But then of course also case studies that are closer to the internet even uh, with Facebook and social networking sites and the many applications we see, social media applications we see on the internet. These are some of the cases uh, that have to do with interoperability and again I will get back to a few of these illustrations. Now interop is everywhere and that makes it really kind of a useful and exciting topic and, and, and just uh, let me start with an everyday example, right? So yesterday I arrived with a flight from Boston to, to Torino via Frankfurt and you take a single transaction like that a relatively straightforward journey from Boston to Torino you're doing it all the time, you're traveling all the time of course so we are used to you know, book our flights online to get to the airport, to swipe our frequent flyer cards to get the e-ticket, to you know, scan that and then you know, ultimately board the airplane have access to the lounge maybe buy a book and pay by credit card uh, and every step right, that I just described very briefly actually requires the exchange of information among systems uh, so of course the booking of a flight and paying it by credit card over a, a travel online travel store requires the exchange of data uh, you're entering it and you have the provider of the web portal and so forth and this um, provider needs to exchange information with the airline, of course, for which you book a seat and the credit card company also needs to be involved and facilitate uh, this transaction and so forth. So you already see how many systems actually need to work together even to book the flight. And then of course once you board the airplane uh, and you do this uh, long flight over the Atlantic, uh, there is a lot of communication happening behind the scenes, in the cockpit, in the towers. Uh, the, the entire airplane has a communication system that is constantly recording and sending information uh, and again you see uh, how data is, is exchanged across systems. So that's just one illustration of an everyday phenomenon uh, that we take for granted that seems straightforward but once you take a look behind the scenes and start to uh, wear an interoperability glass uh, you see these kind of invisible links that connect systems and components. Now quite often of course uh, you recognize um, the problem of lack of interoperability as in the case to stay with the example, that's my bag, travel bag, right? Um, when I arrived yesterday I was without luggage, huh? so the luggage didn't make it. And here you see uh, a downside. So. Uh, all the transaction I described, the checking of the luggage, all that has worked well. The information has you know, been exchanged across systems and the ground uh, handling agency and Lufthansa and so forth. Uh, but somewhere in the chain was a problem, <coughs> most likely in Frankfurt. Uh, and that was not so much a problem of technology or of information flow, but actually an organizational problem, I assume, right? That someone didn't uh, in time I carry or you know, put my uh, luggage into the right container uh, and so you see that uh, um, that's a story we see over and over again even if we think of these complex systems like the travel system and, and the example I just gave you as technology enabled, as data driven that there is often a organizational workflow and also a human layer um, that matters a lot uh, and where you equally need interoperability, the same way you need interoperability at the level of data. 
And that's, that's uh, one of the insights we gained while working through many case studies, that a, a technological view on interoperability is too narrow, that we really also need to take into account upper layers, and I will address that uh, just in a bit. Now, of course, the technical intro comes back into play uh, when you land in Tirino without luggage, you immediately go to the baggage claim and you receive uh, uh, numbers to track, uh, of course, your, your luggage, then you go to the website and uh, ultimately, you know, I got lucky, they found uh, and, and, and um, delivered the luggage uh, to my hotel. So, uh, uh, but again, here you see how information again flows across different systems. Here, this provider of this tracking service that has nothing to do with Lufthansa directly, that's a third party provider. And again, information flows across systems uh, to solve the problem. You also see how the human aspect comes back into play because there is a person bringing you the luggage to the hotel, picking it up based on this information exchange. So um, here, now interoperability has become the solution of a problem by, um, created by a lack of interoperability. So that's just a kind of a brief introduction to, to show how rich um, the topic is and how fascinating it is. Um, we define interoperability roughly, therefore, as the ability to transfer and render useful data and other information across systems, including organizations, applications, or components. A nice way to put it, it's the art and science of working together, uh, which is a line I like very much because all these systems, as we just described it, of course, are technical, it's an engineering problem, it's a computer science problem, but it's also very much a managerial problem, and quite often, as you will see, also a cultural problem uh, uh, or a challenge uh, quite often that we need to, to address to build uh, successful systems in the sense that they interconnect the way we hope they interconnect and work together. So over the past six years, and they will be very brief because I already mentioned it, we, we looked into various case studies, such as the one that I just described as an everyday life example. We looked into digital rights management systems, we looked into mashup innovation, we studied uh, digital identity systems, we looked into uh, smart grid, a very important topic in energy, we looked at uh, electronic data interchange, uh, cloud computing and many other cases. And most recently, as John Galvez can be noted, um, we um, published a book which tries to synthesize all these case studies and the insights we gained um, over the past few years and actually works towards a theory of interoperability. And so what I'd like to do is to use uh, a couple of examples uh, to illustrate some of the findings and some of the results coming out of that research that is further described, of course, in this book. And remember the key question that drives us is first to understand how these systems work together as kind of a descriptive matter, what, what's the logic behind these invisible links, uh, but then second and more importantly the normative question, how much connectivity and interconnectedness do we want to have in our society as we build the next generation of energy system or healthcare systems or social media systems. Let me start with a first example that we also have covered in our work and share then, based on this example, a few general observations with you from this emerging theory of interoperability and uh, hopefully this also sets the stage for, for a discussion. This is a video by IBM. We should have sound. Why does it work for people? Oh. It's not shooting my flight on TV. Really? 
Yeah, they want the cops, ambulance and fire service all interconnected. And share information. Well, I guess, but all that traffic congestion and pollution won't be good for your asthma. Okay. Well, what about Dublin or Stockholm now? <laughs> They've like integrated their traffic systems. So there's one ticket for trains, buses, ferries and toll roads. Oh, handy. People get alerts if there are delays, so they can choose the best way to get where they want to be. In Stockholm, they've cut down greenhouse gases by like 40% or something. With the cold and your asthma? Well, what about Spain? Spain. Spain's not too cool. Mm. And there, they have interconnected health services. So I won't have to run around getting my medical history to different doctors, specialists and pharmacists. They'll have it all on one single electronic health record. Well, that's smart. But what about the water and utilities? Yeah. You don't want to live in a place unless it has a guaranteed energy supply and good quality water. Huh. You mean like in Malta? So, and it goes on and on, like, you know, Dad and Son talking about uh, the, the place where, where this kid uh, wants to work after, you know, graduating from university. And, and the topic here really is, by this um, video produced by IBM, to show uh, how we really move towards smart cities. And, of course, you're all deeply familiar with the underlying technology, the Internet of Things, where uh, the infrastructure and objects are to talk to each other, and uh, where we have this deeply um, uh, deep network of, of connections, not only among people, but also among uh, infrastructure. So, uh, one of the observations, and I use this example, smart cities, just as, as, a, as a, a, a case in point, um, many of the problems actually, and many of the things we studied, many of the big challenges we face as a society, really the solution to these big uh, problems increasingly depend on interoperability. Uh, how, how do we make, uh, how do we address climate change issues? How do we, um, uh, how do we become more efficient in our healthcare systems? Uh, how do we solve um, uh, our environmental challenges? In many of these areas, uh, you would see that this question of interoperability becomes really uh, a, a key uh, question. Not only how do we establish interoperability and interconnectedness, but also how do we maintain it over time. And the smart city life, uh, how do we increase quality of life in cities? As we've seen in this video, that's another uh, one of these big societal challenges where interop is absolutely key. Now, one of the things we've seen in examples such as smart cities and many others is that interoperability is not a black and white thing. That's an important characteristic that we can distill from these case studies. Interoperability comes in various degrees. Um, so sometimes you have uh, quite perfect interoperability. For instance, if you're using uh, your iPhone with your uh, Mac uh, book, that's kind of almost perfect interoperability. It's very convenient with your iTunes music store and so forth. But as soon as you take the same phone, but have a, a laptop of a different provider with different operating system and try to use a different music store, you immediately recognize it's much harder. You have to tweak and hack sometimes, right? Uh, and of course, the same also applies even with uh, when we travel and need uh, adapters for our you know, um, power cords and so forth. So we develop techniques also how to bridge between systems where we don't have perfect interoperability to ensure they're working together once the last like travel adapters, right? It's an example of this category where we hack in a way that the system. Uh, so that's that's an important aspect, and you see also that in the in the um, in the case of smart cities, that interop doesn't necessarily mean that you have uniformity. So you still can have multiple systems. Think of transportation system here in touring uh, where you have buses, you have the metro and, and trains and so forth and you can link together these various types of infrastructure by creating uh, a, a joint reference system uh, so it doesn't mean that you have need to agree on one single standard or one single uh, technology. That's an important aspect. The second one is uh, that we learn from examples such as smart cities but also in particular healthcare and their traffic control example. Once you have systems in place, it's very hard to um, make them more or less interoperable. Uh, that's a real challenge uh, because you have a stickiness of the technology. Once you're used to certain systems, uh, you have all these uh, legacy problems. It's really, really hard uh, to then make the changes uh, 
for instance, air traffic, just to give you another uh, illustration, almost all devices that we use have inbuilt GPS systems, right? Our cell phones have GPS, um, we have GPS in cars and so forth. The, the air traffic system hasn't caught up with that, so uh, you don't have much GPS technology in airplanes. And that is because the entire system was designed and built at a time uh, where GPS uh, was not uh, existent, or actually at least not available uh, uh, commercially, or was reserved for, for military purposes. And now it's so hard to change that system and, and make it more uh, effective, even if we have better technology. So that's an illustration of this kind of legacy problem and past dependency problem that we see in many, many cases. Now generally, that's another key finding from our various um, case studies. Generally speaking, interoperability is a good thing. Uh, the example of the iPhone is again a good illustration. It's very convenient if things work together properly without hassle. Uh, so user autonomy, User convenience is a big advantage of interoperability quite often. Also, the airline example, of course, is, is, a, is a good story in that context. Uh, but more from a systems perspective, one of the um, deep dives in it is really to understand whether more interoperability leads to more innovation, especially in the internet space. And our finding is yes, indeed, more interop uh, is good for innovation. And I will get back to that very briefly, why this is the case. So, uh, uh, innovation, uh, one of the benefits, economic growth as a result of innovation, all the benefits of um, intro. The smart city, in addition to these general observations, the smart city example, again, uh, nicely highlights what I try to introduce with this everyday example of my missing luggage and that is that interoperability uh, comes at different layers so we discussed already the technological interoperability where actually uh, systems need to connect first and foremost that they can talk together but then also um, there's a data layer, human layer and a institutional layer of interoperability and within each layer, you need to organize the working together as well as across the layers. Um, in the video, you may have uh, recognized this example of firefighters that are able to uh, talk and communicate with other rescue forces, including the police and, 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 um, and uh, other first responders. Now, that's a great narrative to, to show the importance of these layers. Remember 9-11, right? The, the big tragedy in the US, uh, which of course was a high, high, high stress moment for first responders. And this is really interesting um, uh, as a case study, looking at it through an interoperability lens. So even uh, uh, the firefighters and, and the police were actually able to communicate with each other because they had radio communication using the same frequencies and so forth so that technically they could hear each other. Even the data was transmitted, the voices and so forth. Uh, there were problems at the human layer, uh, for instance the language used. If you uh, go back and study that in depth, not only in the 9-11 context but beyond, you would see that firefighters and police forces and, and other emergency uh, forces are actually using sometimes coded language and the codes they use for instance we have a 903 right that may mean something for the police force may mean something totally different for, for the firefighters and so you see at this kind of human level uh, how the use of language creates interoperability problems although the devices are able to connect and and the data is flowing, the information is flowing. Um, that's actually a, a big problem also in air traffic control, so fascinating case study there. Uh, uh, for instance, the, the standardized English that now is used among pilots and air traffic controllers, uh, that has had a long history to get to that point. Uh, so that was not happening from overnight, essentially. Uh, first, uh, pilots used local language, French pilot, Frank, French, Italian, pilot, Italian, 
and natural language, and only over time, due to many misunderstandings and accidents, one moved to a more standardized use of language uh, that then ultimately, not so long ago actually, became internationally harmonized as a standard. So you can see how language is a great illustration of interoperability um, at this human layer. And then on top of that, you have institutional policy interoperability. Of course, in Europe, think about the European Union and directives enacted by the European uh, Union as one example, as one technique to establish interoperability to you know, enable the free flow of goods or, or uh, or labor across Europe by you know, not making all the laws of all member states directly and necessarily identical, uh, but make them similar enough that they can work together. Uh, a great example of institutional interoperability. To go back to the rescue example um, and 9 11, where you see some of the consequences if that doesn't work together nicely, um, systems. So it turns out that, of course. Uh, police forces and firefighters, they each have their jurisdiction and chain of command. And in that case, it was particularly uh, uh, tragic because the firefighters in the, in the towers, they were overhearing the radio communication by the police helicopters outside. And the helicopter pilots and the police, they basically recognized that the towers got really unstable and are potentially collapsing. They communicate that over radio, but the firefighters in the towers who could overhear the communication didn't respond to that because they said that's not our jurisdiction and not our chain of command. Uh, we only, you know, receive commands and listen to commands from our uh, unit chief and so forth. So you see again, if working together at this policy layer to which uh, 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 jurisdiction is one part of it. Um, if that breaks down, even the best technology, even a common shared language doesn't help you, there is more that you need to organize uh, in order to make systems work together efficiently. So we'll be quicker on the next few examples, so open platforms is uh, another one. Uh, I already mentioned that Interop has the promise to foster innovation. Uh, there, uh, that's one of the key reasons why we think uh, from a public policy perspective interoperability should be uh, a high prior priority for law and policy makers. Now let's take a look at this argument, more interop good for innovation. Facebook, when Facebook opened up its um, application programming interface, its API, we have seen even within a few months thousands of applications uh, produced by you know, a network of people that are uh, not necessarily coordinated, um, uh, that then could be uh, used on Facebook as a, as a platform. So the, um, the uh, success of Facebook as well as of Twitter has a lot to do with actually establishing interoperability. For instance, in the Twitter case that Juan Carlos, I already received your tweet right from the presentation, <laughs> uh, can use his cell phone and everyone can use the cell phone or the laptop computer actually to tweet something and then Twitter highly interoperable distributes that to, to the network, whatever device, across devices, whatever device we use. So that's uh, quite a powerful illustration of the type of innovation we see. Um, here is another story uh, that illustrates the same logic from um, the web uh, uh, applications again. Uh, that's Ushahidi. So Ushahidi is actually a platform developed by a Harvard Law School graduate student um, in the uh, context of the uh, elections in, in uh, Kenya in 2007. And the idea is that uh, you use Google Maps or, or alternative here open street maps and let people uh, volunteers of all sorts submit their observations um, uh, to this platform and map their comments on, on this map. And these maps have played a role not only in Kenya where the idea was if I would observe a manipulation of the election I could report it and we could aggregate all the information uh, from all these volunteers, but has also played a huge role in Haiti after that earthquake, also in the context of the white uh, 
wildfires in, in Russia. And in Haiti, actually, this platform arguably has played uh, a significant role in um, organizing and making more efficient uh, the allocation of resources where they were needed most uh, after the earthquake in Haiti. So again, you see, we have here, first from an engineering perspective, uh, an internal problem because you take say Google Maps or OpenStreetMap as one thing and then uh, you allow or create a system, design a system where users can use either their cell phones and text or they can send emails or they can use their laptop computers to submit comments that you then map on this platform so you have multiple um, design choices to make to, to bring these um, particular components of the system together and make them, integrate them in a way that they're helpful. But you then also see how this level of technical interoperability, this Haiti example, leads to more efficient help, which again is kind of an organizational um, challenge here uh, and also ultimately does good for, for people uh, because you can help people more efficiently who are victims after such a natural disaster. So again, you see these different layers, how they play together. So, I uh, want to be brief on that. Uh, um, these, I've shown these few examples just to give you a sense what kind of innovation we see when we study uh, interoperability and ask, okay, what's the effect now uh, of interoperability on systems in terms of innovation? There is a lot of anecdotal evidence, so you can bring many, many case studies as the ones I just described, where you see, okay, higher levels of intro lead to really innovative outcomes, like the Shahidi platform, like the Facebook story, like the Twitter story. Um, but there is not much empirical evidence that makes this case, so uh, you have to go back to economic theory, as well as some uh, more uh, uh, current theories of innovation, I listed a few here, won't go into detail, uh, that actually explain or help explain why the interop leads to more innovation. The basic argument is it lowers the threshold for entrepreneurs essentially to enter a market uh, and to develop at relatively low costs uh, new pieces of technology or to build their you know, kind of offerings on top of platforms that are interoperable and so kind of this lowering of the um, entry threshold uh, is, is one of the key reasons why we see more interop. Now let me perhaps end with, with, with that example, credit cards. So far I've been uh, talking about the benefits of interoperability but there are of course also drawbacks. Uh, credit cards is a great example. We all use credit cards. It's a highly interoperable system, right? Whether you have American Express or MasterCard or Visa and regardless which bank you have, you can use them in many stores and pay with it. It's totally interoperable um, in many respects and it's super convenient that looking at the uh, uh, survey data actually uh, people use uh, credit cards because they're so convenient. Now, but of course uh, you see drawbacks, we all read the newspapers where there is a lot of talk about identity theft, about privacy and security breaches, data breaches, a huge uh, problem we have to deal with. And you can argue that actually this may be a downside of interoperability uh, because the more, uh, that's the point here, the more uh, uh, components of the system, let's say that's the store where you pay by credit card, that's the credit card uh, intermediary, uh, that then would be the issuing bank, that would be your bank account. Uh, the more components need to work together to enable a transaction in this highly interoperable system, the more likely it is that you have some sort of a, a breach of data or kind of a vulnerability within the system. Uh, and so one of the big questions also for, for um, engineers and computer scientists, of course, how do we make these systems secure even if they are open and highly interoperable. Uh, the role of open standards in this context is particularly 
important. The takeaway from our research there is that usually we see interoperability, uh, that, that we see privacy and security as a design problem, uh, so that, we, uh, that the argument is we need to take into account how can we engineer, how can we design systems that are interoperable, but also take into account some of these drawbacks. And again, this is this notion that we don't aim for maximum interop, but um, for optimum interoperability. Maybe one one last point I want to make, and I will, I will have you know more examples to illustrate that. We also mapped how do we get so two steps back, right? We have shown interoperability generally is a sound public policy goal because it leads to more innovation and more competition and economic growth, benefits for users, user autonomy, flexibility, convenience, systems efficiency, these are some of the benefits. We argue and acknowledge, okay, there are also important drawbacks like privacy and security. Based on case studies, our findings suggest, well, these drawbacks are not a reason against interoperability, but it's a reason to be very careful when we think about the design of interoperable systems. Okay, so that's argument number one. Argument number two then is, well, how do we get to more interoperability? I already mentioned some of the legacy problems uh, that we see. And to answer this question, again, we have looked in across all these case studies at the ways in which more interoperability has been achieved and have tried to map these different approaches on the chart where we look at both the uh, contributions that public policy makers can make as well as the responsibility and, post, uh, and potential of private actors. And so you get a, a relatively um, you know, rich map of, of different approaches. Um, for instance, governments, and that's pretty uh, important these days, can do a lot in terms of coordinating among uh, private actors to encourage them to agree on a, on a particular standard, for instance, in cloud computing. This is currently a big topic. What are standards for cloud computing? Of course, government can also exercise its procurement power um, to shape the market and, and drive us to more interoperable solutions. Um, but then, more importantly, perhaps even is what the private sector is doing to increase interoperability. We see a lot of collaboration among companies, of course. Uh, I mentioned a few examples uh, already. I'm mostly using IP licensing for the lawyers in the room uh, to negotiate and increase uh, the flow of information across the services and platforms, uh, as well as some other techniques. So, uh, the, the challenge, this, that's the last slide, uh, the challenge is somehow to to determine for each system case by case what is the optimum level of interoperability, how much interoperability or interconnectedness do we want. Then, uh, that was the last point, how to get there, what is the best tool in a given context uh, to achieve more interoperability. And uh, one of the things that is particularly uh, controversial is how much government intervention do we need uh, if we want to get to higher levels of interop, be it in healthcare, be it in transportation, be it uh, uh, when we talk about e-commerce and cloud computing, how much of the government, for instance, intervene and, and mandate standards, something that we think is generally not a good idea because governments don't have a good sense usually uh, of what the best technology is to solve a problem, but sometimes actually it may be necessary that the government intervenes. Uh, healthcare is a good example uh, where uh, we argue the government needs to be proactive to overcome uh, the barriers to interoperability. Uh, and another uh, important question is how can we actually manage interop over time? There is much to be said about that in the library context, for instance. Another important example, how do we preserve knowledge over time? And after even a few years, our uh, uh, DVDs and our discs don't play anymore on these machines. How do we uh, uh, preserve and manage interop of knowledge over time? Uh, these are some of the many, many uh, fascinating questions uh, that we have worked through. Uh, and 
and obviously that this is work in progress. So uh, looking forward to the future. About the role of uh, uh, strategic behavior of uh, big players, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, well, the the world famous cases like the Microsoft One concerned some kind of uh, uh, in interoperability. Uh, uh, recently, we had uh, uh, relevant uh, e examples in the in the. Um, uh, semantic web field with uh, schema.org or Facebook uh, open graph. I mean, these are um, fields in, in which we are building new technologies. We have uh, standards uh, approved and endorsed by W3C, but uh, it, it seems that in order to achieve the, the critical mass of uh, people using the, the, the same kind of a, a approach, we also need the, the role of uh, big commercial players. And then can, they can uh, tweak or optimize a little bit their own version of the standard in, in, in order to fine-tune interoperability, maybe not in the direction of maximum interoperability, but in the direction of uh, their own uh, version of optimal interoperability, meaning, meaning the optimal degree of interoperability for their own business, maybe, and not for society. So uh, I just wanted to ask you to uh, elaborate on this kind of situation. Grateful that, that you mentioned that, and of course that's a, a very important dimension of, of the problem. Uh, and indeed, the markets you're talking about are usually markets with very strong network effects, right? That's what you see why it is so hard for any uh, new social networking sites, for instance, to be successful. Uh, Google Plus, right? A uh, very hard time to even for Google to challenge Facebook, and and the, the reason, of course, is because Facebook has has successfully used uh, these network effects. It had relatively early on, was the first mover, had relatively early on uh, a relatively large number of users and with each additional users the value of the network increases for every participant and if a company is in a situation like that and the market with strong network effects it arguably has very strong incentives not to be interrupted Right? because there is likelihood that you get the entire market for at least a certain time and that you can maximize your profits by creating a closed system. Speaking of closed systems, right? that's the same with Apple strategy and they've done it very successfully. Now, the Microsoft uh, case that you refer to illustrates, of course, that this may change over time. Uh, this strategy may run into trouble, and the troubles can be at least twofold. On the one hand side, it may well be that consumers at some point get annoyed and say, hey, you know what, I want to be able to move my data out of Facebook, right, my many thousand pages of information, and tra transfer it to the next cooler social networking platform that emerges. Uh, and so consumers and the market may actually put pressure on, on these big companies to create more interoperable solutions. Um, or, uh, on the other hand side, uh, you may run into regulatory issues, like in the Microsoft case, where um, the company gets too powerful and uh, is abusing its position, ultimately that's where competition law kicks in. And then, of course, uh, there is also another generation of, of, uh, of uh, companies that try to use the, the logic of the new digital environment and create interoperable solution from scratch because uh, they think actually uh, only through this approach of interoperability uh, we can make our service popular. So all, all the things you mentioned I think are reflected also in, in our findings and it depends very much on uh, how many players you have on a particular market, how mature is the market uh, how mature is the technology we're talking about to then figure out why is a company behaving like that uh, or not why is the company 
um, creating a closed non-interoperable system or only a system that is vertically interoperable but not horizontally like many of the um, social media applications uh, or why are companies actually going with a full interop approach from the beginning to orchestrate that is very difficult and, and to us it's, it's uh, we're very um, uh, careful <laughs> when we talk about uh, the role of the government in orchestrating these market forces uh, we really want to uh, have uh, strong uh, safeguards in place such as competition well, for sure um, to ensure that if things go wrong the private sector that you can intervene and it's a, a separate conversation uh, how effective these legal mechanisms are they're very costly and very slow so that's a challenge for, for us, for the policy makers. A great one. Any questions? I, if not, uh, I'll make one of my questions, which is uh, very recently in the, um, in the Oracle uh, Google case, uh, which touched a very important aspect. I speak as a computer engineer, APIs, and actually the ruling that, that uh, uh, found that there was no copyright infringement in the I think it was crucial in keeping interoperability in that space. Absolutely. Have you, have you followed it all that, that case? Or? Well, we have followed it, but it's, you're totally right, it's absolutely crucial as an interrupt story. Totally. It's, if that, the ruling had gone the other way, interoperability yeah. in the software space would have been incredibly more difficult. Actually, yeah. this was a landmark case for interoperability. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, just a question about the players. Uh, we've seen many, many times struggle between uh, among uh, interested parties. I, I was uh, thinking about the spare, uh, the spare parts market uh, for uh, uh, vehicles of uh, every kind. We've seen a big struggle uh, that uh, endured for 20 years, 30 years within the uh, European Union. I think we've seen. Uh, uh, the car makers on one side, and then the uh, spare parts makers on the other, and then the consumer, the consumers and the insurance uh, companies uh, struggling to find a, a rule which, which was an interoperability rule. It was a legal interoperability rule, but also technical and certainly. Uh, I was thinking here, the players, who they are. We see, we see the companies, some companies saying uh, we have a market, uh, we have a system which is uh, closed, can be uh, uh, closed uh, uh, in every sense or a little bit open or just open uh, depending on uh, our interest. Uh, but uh, are we, uh, do, do, we, do, do we have uh, uh, other players uh, how are they organizing themselves? It's a, it's a great example and I don't have a good answer, but, but you're absolutely right. These, uh, um, these struggles may, may sometimes really take a very long time. And, and one of the hard questions, if we say, okay, we trust, we trust the private sector and the market forces to sort it out, well, what happens if you have collective action problems, right? If you have uh, consumers that are not well organized, that are not that powerful vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, very strong industries that, that also are you know, very successful in lobbying and so forth. So these are, these are really hard questions and, and that's also where you know, we may be more sympathetic to, to envision a particular role of the government. Um, now, one a quick example I want to mention is cell phone chargers, which is a, another interesting story where, you know, of course we all have our, our drawers full of cell phone chargers from, from our Nokia, from our iPhone, and you know, I have a drawer full of cable, right, to charge cell phones that I don't use anymore, of course. Um, and, and for a long time, uh, cell phone manufacturers have been reluctant to uh, think about the shared standard, although consumers wanted it for a long time, and it's also producing an enormous amount of waste uh, in the environment, and uh, not much has happened over many years until recently, as you know, the European Commission 
use a technique called regulation by threat. Uh, uh, convinced a group of stakeholders, including, of course, the industry, and said, you may want to really think hard about the, the common standard for cell phone charges in Europe, because if you don't think hard enough, then we will start thinking about the standard. And so this was an interesting combination, if you think back, uh, uh, look at the slide here, um, uh, where the government used some of its uh, uh, convening power on the one hand side, but was also signaling potential intervention down the road to stimulate that the uh, companies that weren't perfectly aligned in their interests, obviously, uh, started to at least you know, work towards a, a single cell phone uh, charger standard. So sometimes notching uh, and behavior of this sort and interventions of this sort government may be helpful to overcome uh, some of the problems you mentioned. I'm not sure whether this now would apply to the car industry, but, but that's kind of just to, to add to that uh, as a possible solution or approach. One more question. If there are no other questions, I, I, I just wanted to comment on, on, on your question and on something uh, you said about the role of governments. For instance, uh, in the domain of uh, software interoperability, uh, you have uh, uh, several kind of issues which are uh, strongly related with the existence of uh, software patents or the uh, uh, copyrightability of uh, 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 APIs or programming language or this kind of very abstract parts of software. Uh, so even if uh, 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 you may be uh, reluctant in uh, suggesting to government that they have to enter directly into the debate, they are setting the stage, for instance, uh, through uh, intellectual property rules. So uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, they, they, they could or not uh, uh, allow for uh, self-help in the domain of interoperability through reverse in, in engineering and, and so on. And they are tweaking uh, with these kind of rules, like uh, the interoperability exception of a copyright uh, of a software directive in, in, in Europe. So in, in any case, they, they, they play a very strong role. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, uh, Again, a very good point that has come up in our research as well. Uh, it would be a mistake to believe the government is neutral, as you just pointed out. Indeed, the government is setting the ground rules, and the relation, especially between law and interoperability, is very complex. In some cases, law may work in favor of interoperability, but then in others, it may actually do quite some harm. And if you think about digital rights management and the protection of DRM through anti circumvention provisions and all the reverse engineering um, uh, issues that you just mentioned. That's a great example where the law isn't helpful for interop. Uh, and then you have other examples where the law is helpful, for instance, where it requires the disclosure of interoperability information. Uh, but your point is absolutely acknowledged. It's not uh, that the government uh, would have a choice to make whether to get involved in these interop debates or not. The government is involved already by setting the ground rules. Um, what I was comment on, commenting on previously was more like exposed once you learn something may not go into the right direction uh, as you desire it, do you then intervene or not? So uh, it's almost kind of a two layer uh, analysis we have to work through, which makes it even more complex. But I couldn't agree more with your description. And, and since you mentioned the government, you do actually write public procurement. Uh, and recently, when I was preparing the course on digital revolution and reading uh, books about the history of the internet, there's a crucial point I think in 81, early 80s, when the uh, Defense Department makes a decision. Every, every networking equipment or software had to be TCPIP. And that was a turning point, because then among competing networking technologies, there was a huge signal saying, we want to be TCPIP which in turn is very open to interoperability, but that was a very clear public intervention in favor of a specific technology. It's a great example. Any more questions? Yes, Monica? Given that we are inside the university, what is the role of education for Thank you. 
No, uh, it's, it's a fantastic question. And, and actually, just to within one area that I mentioned at the very beginning, take our shared field of research, Internet and Society, right? And I mentioned that we're working on, on building an international network of such centers. Um, it's, it's very much also a, a, a responsibility of academia to work through some of these problems uh, where the cost-benefit analysis may be different from country to country depending on the values that the culture shares, right? The Chinese think very different about some of the standards we're talking about and then the Europeans and the US again just look at cell phone standards and you see the, the different uh, choices made and I don't even want to address the free speech uh, value differences uh, and there I think uh, academia uh, uh, can play a very very important role to build bridges and at least uh, start to um, facilitate and engage in conversations about these value differences um, and think about possible interoperable, uh, interoperable solutions to, to, to negotiate between these uh, different systems. That's certainly kind of one, one role of the university. And the second one, of course, is also the educational or direct educational part of our students and of our children uh, as consumers, as users of you know, these digital technologies, um, where it's important to um, enable them to have the level of literacy uh, to understand um, how can I combine different devices, how can I make smart decisions about which system uh, I buy into acknowledging some of the locking effects we talked about uh, to, to become smarter about these decisions from a consumer perspective. That's another uh, way education comes into play. And I'm sure there are many more also in digital humanities. Uh, of, of course, uh, interop plays a key role when we think about uh, uh, the next generation of libraries or museums or, and so forth. These are all interop based uh, stories uh, also in the digital Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, let me thank again both our pro-rector, thank you for coming here, and uh, our guest, uh, Professor Ruskasen, thank you so much.